um, I want to ask if, you, if you've asked this question of yourself, you know, like, how does this Christian faith work? I wonder if you've asked yourself that. What is the key that unlocks the mystery of life, and how do we live it out? I think they're all really good questions, and I think the, the book of Romans helps us address. But they're, they're questions that we all have to get a handle on, and I would say even our students in the room today. And I want to take a minute to frame faith to our students. One, Christianity in America is an easy default religion. When your parents bring you to church, you kind of you have to be around it. And, but that default, the idea of it being a default religion has some pluses and it has some major limitations. And if you were brought to church and this has become a default religion for you, I think these will also apply. Here are some of the pluses that I think about that. One, it offers a meaningful, meaningful connect point with your parents that no other shared experience can match. I've been to dance recitals. I've been to cheerleading tryouts. I've been to football games. I've been to a lot of connections with my daughter. But the best one I have is the connections that we have had in church and around church. Church and religion can offer a consistent and predictable stability to your family, unlike just sharing a little league field together. Number th the third one is that your parents' religion can sort of keep you in line morally for the fear of hell. And, I, and, I, and sp sp spoken, I'm speaking from the standpoint that, that um, I, mom raised me in church, and that very fear of hell served a really good purpose in my life for a long period of time. Right? <laughs> So, so there is some value. There is some value to that. The fourth is that you get surrendered. You get surrounded by people who care about you now and how you develop. I don't want you to think about that. We have two, specifically two full-time pastors on staff who develop large and talented serving adult teams, all dedicated to developing and shaping a faith for our students that will stick and last forever. I mean, sometimes we just think church has to has the, have those things for people to come. And I want you to understand that nobody in this room is a customer today. We're not customers. So because we're not customers, we're not developing things to satisfy customers. But, that these things are here and people are here so that we can grow and mature as followers of Christ. And it is the commitment of the body to do this for our students. So those are really good pluses about Christianity in America that may not exist everywhere else. But here are some of the glaring limitations of this idea of it being a default religion. One, Christianity as a religion can be taught, but faith can't be transferred. Students, you have to pick this faith up by yourself. The second is there comes a point in time in your life where you have to begin making your own faith applications. You have to wrestle it down and make it your own. And can I make this suggestion as a middle school and high school student that this and college students that are close enough to come back home, unlike mine, um, this is the place to wrestle with it by people that around, are surrounding you and believing you in a safe environment. This is the environment to wrestle with the hard stuff because this world challenges it and your university will challenge it greatly and this is a great place to wrestle it down. And the last one, I think, is a glaring limitation of this kind of transferred um, default faith is that a default faith gets left behind in the dust when things get hard. But a realized faith carries you through all kinds of hardship. So it's time to realize our faith. And Paul writes Romans to give us a proper foundation for our faith. And I wanted to say it like this because I've said that Romans is a hard book to swallow. But it's not because God wants to confuse us. You know why Romans is hard? Romans is hard because it thinks otherworldly. Paul is introducing otherworldly concepts, and we are consumed in this world, so they're hard to understand. So, it, so it's not because God wants to make it confusing. It's, just, it's hard to get through all the other stuff that we have layers onto it. And we live in a culture that challenges the very foundation of the Christian faith. If you were here last week, who was here last week? You, you, so you got a head start. you got a head start. The rest of you, you have to catch up. You're going to have to go listen to all three services because I ended up missing something in each one, and you need to kind of get them all together. That 
G that Caesar, the emperor, was considered God. So we, we, asked, we had to settle the question of ownership. And the question Paul asks is, is Jesus our emperor or is Caesar our emperor? Who do we belong to? Do we live for ourselves or do we, and we live for this life? Or who do we live for? Is Christianity just a religion of rules to follow? Or is Christianity a faith that restores us in relationship with God who created us? Romans answers all of that. We're going we're gonna to finish the chapter 1 of Romans. We're going to do chapter 2, so I'll settle down. You all settle in. And we're going we're gonna to get in through chapter 3 today. But I'm going to highlight some things. But I encourage you to get a notebook. I encourage you to read through it yourself so that you can really try to embody all of what Paul's speaking in Romans. In Romans 1, 18 through 32, there are four things that I believe encapsulate these, this section. And so I'll give them to you up front, and then we'll work backwards. One is that you can't have mercy without wrath. God is not bipolar. All right, these verses will point this out. You, you can't have the mercy of God without understanding the wrath of God because God is not bipolar. Second, creation has an ongoing power of revelation. Creation has had, does have, and will continue to have an ongoing power of revelation. Third, idols fill the worship vacuum, but they don't fulfill it. And they have more power than you think, idols do. And the last one that this section, I think, bears out is God gives over, but God doesn't give up. If you've ever wondered why we live in the kind of society we live in and the stuff that you watch on the news, Paul answers it in this section. All right? Again, I love when you write. I want you to take pictures, if, but there's also these slides are also available Every week on our website, when you go to the archive of the message, there's a drop-down box, and it gives you all the slides as well, okay? Uh, so here we go. I'm, let's, read it. let's read. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since way, what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. I just love that, right? And if you're a parent of a child, you understand what that phrase is. Plain to them. Because we say it differently. We say it more, more like this. How in the world could you not understand what I said? That, that, that's how we say it as parents. But, but he's saying it made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are, out with, are without excuse. He's talking about creation. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, therefore, for this reason, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who was forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women who were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over. Three times he uses the same phrase. It's... It's serious when you're going to repeat it that many times in this short amount of time. God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. Anybody want to duck yet? They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. I know parents want to kind of hover there for a moment. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree, 
that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, these very things, but also approve of those who do them, who practice them as well. Not just the ones who do, but a society, a culture, a mankind, or even approve of things that we might not do, but we approve of them if someone else does them. And here is how he ends the first chapter. Let's talk about wrath, the wrath of God first of all. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness, wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So wrath of God. Some would say, I don't need any explanation of the wrath of God because that's the only way you've ever seen it. He is the God that wants to catch us breaking his law so that he can then display his wrath on us. Now, let me help you with the context to which Paul is writing. If you remember last week that we talked about that the, one of the, um, the titles for Caesar was son of God. Okay, And so in this time frame, which Paul would have written, there was a Roman emperor named Caliglia. And he, would, he loved punishing and executing and, and persecuting people. That was, it was a pastime for him that he would come up with obscure laws, write them in fine print, and he would post them out of sight from people so that he could punish them for breaking something they never even knew existed. Although God has wrath on sin, God is not a capricious God. And so God is not an unpredictable God who invents rules and ways and makes them blind to everybody so that he can punish them. That is not how he operates. But it's not possible to disassociate God's mercy and his grace from his wrath. And here's what I mean. A love of good can't logically exist without a hate of evil. Now, in our postmodern society, we can separate things like that and we can treat them as independently. But it, you cannot love good logically unless there is also a hate of evil. To accept a God of mercy, you have to accept that his mercy is in response to something. It's a, his respons it's, it's, it's a response to his wrath due to our disobedience. To accept the God of love, you have to accept that his love is in response to something. What's his love in response to? His love is in response to our rejection of that love. Right? Because true love only happens when it is received and given freely, not when it's coerced. So for God to be a God of love who gives love, he has, it's in response to a rejection of that love. It, uh, uh, it counterbalances that. To accept of God of grace, you have to accept that his grace is in response to something. See, mercy is getting something we don't deserve. Grace is getting something we can't earn. So there had to be something we couldn't earn for grace to exist for him to give it. Are you following me? God is not bipolar, but you cannot have mercy and grace and love without the understanding of the other things, and it is a response to his wrath. But God's wrath is not a temper. It's not his temper. It's not triggered in a manner that we don't know how it gets triggered. And God's wrath is an attitude towards sin. It is not an unpredictable emotion. I don't know if I wrote it out right, but, but here's one of the ways I looked at it. That God pours out his wrath on sin. And consequently, we'll find out that he's poured it out on his son. And he pours his grace and mercy out on people who accept the faith. So a person can sink with their sin or they can rise on the surface of God's forgiveness, his mercy and grace. See, in our society, in order to reduce convictions on certain things, we want to lower penalty. We want to lower the bar. So the, the, a big conversation that goes on now is how many people are in prison because of kind of misdemeanor drug kind of charges. Okay. So one time, we thought that these charges were important, and so, but because our jails are filling up with some of these drug uh, charges, the, the answer becomes, well, we need to take those laws off. We need to reduce those laws, and then we'll reduce the, the convictions. Well, d no, duh, right? So, so if, if all of us leave you know, and get on 65 today, and all of us collectively drive 100, is the best explanation of not giving us a ticket to raise the speed limit. No, the speed limit is there for a purpose. And just because we decide that that purpose is wrong doesn't change this. See, God doesn't do that. God doesn't say, because there's so many sinners, we need to somehow reduce the bar of sin. And if we can lower that bar, then there's so many more people free. And it sounds logical until you figure out what he said was, no, the bar is the bar. 
but so that everybody can be free, I'll send my son. You don't get more inclusive than that if you want to use that language of our time. So he doesn't reduce what will bring his wrath. He just decides to shift that wrath on his son who gives all of us who will accept and live by faith freedom in Christ. Now you're all a little more with me than the 830 crowd that walked in out of the rain. <laughs> all right. Number two, creation has the ongoing power. That means I'm going to keep you longer. Creation has an ongoing power of revelation. Christians marvel at creation, especially men. We watch Nat Geo like it's, like it's crazy. But athlete, or atheists try to explain creation by natural causes. But everyone gets wowed by creation. Atheists are, 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 are Christian. We're wowed. We're just amazed at what develops and how it develops and how did that happen and what in the world. How could you even put those things together for this? To do? So we're wowed by creation. However... When you reject God, then you're left to try to fill out, well, how did this all get here? There's kind of an illustration that gets used in this kind of conversation that says that a watchmaker gives, leaves the impression that there, I mean, the watch, a watch, leaves the impression that there was a watchmaker. Because you can't have the intricacy of the movements of a watch without a mind behind putting that watch together. A watch doesn't just appear. I can throw a bunch of used parts in my backyard and come out in a million years, and it's not going to be a watch. Never. Part of creation, what God develops in creation, is this ongoing revelation that there is a creator so that no man is without an excuse. And that kind of sounds like, well, you don't get an excuse because I created everything. I think I see it in a different way. I see it as God saying, listen, I want to give you every opportunity to discover that I'm here. And so if I need to do it through a red bird or a blue jay or a caterpillar, I'm going to do it. It's here. It's before you. Come on now. Wake up. Let's see it. And for that reason, I would say that Christians should be the most ecological conscious people there ever were. But not in an effort to save the planet. We're not going to save the planet. You know why? Because sin corrupted the planet. So the planet even longs with yearnings for the return of Christ to be restored to how I created it. But it, so I'm not going to somehow save the planet, but I can still be a steward in which God created me to be. Okay. So listen, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, my wife recycles, good grief. I mean, she tell, now that goes in there, that goes, I, I can't make sense of all the garbage cans. But do you, even our society lists like not recycling as one, like one of the major sins in the world is not recycling. Like seriously? See, so you understand that creation is there to reveal who God is. And it's so doing so everybody can discover who he is and, and not, not get lost in all this. Third one, idols fill the worship vacuum, but they don't fulfill it. And idols have more power than you think. Here's what Paul said in verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God with images made to look like mortal human beings, birds, animals, and reptiles. I've told you this before, in the West, we don't create idols. We are the idol. The achievement of, of, of our either ease or comfort or pleasure or whatever, we become, we become the idol. We were all created to worship something. That's why you can go anywhere in the world at any time in history, find any remote group of people, and there's going to be worship going on. There is this vacuum to worship. But when we fill this vacuum with idols, it doesn't produce what we think it's going to produce. It actually produces death. David had this to say in the Psalms. He talked about, he said, what, you know, don't worship things that can't see, that can't hear, that can't move or can't speak. He said, because you will become like one of them. All right, so what does that mean? If I'm worshiping this idol and it doesn't move, hear, speak, or talk, or think, or anything else, and if I worship it, do I become someone who doesn't think, speak? What is he getting at? I'll say this is what he's getting at. This idol is dead. And so I will end up being like what I worship. And if I continue to worship lifeless things, then I too will end up dead. Dead spiritually. Dead intellectually. It's, it's, I'm going to be dead. And here, here was the thing that Pastor Michael alluded to. I, there's two main problems with worship of stuff that we create. One is inanimate objects. These, but I want to also include ideas and philosophies. They can't receive our worship. 
I mean, I think that's one of the things Paul's getting to. You're worshiping this idol. This block of wood has no clue you're here. There, 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 you know, just no, no clue of what's going on. And you're there and you're pouring this out and you're dropping this off and you're doing all these things. And, and, and it's clueless. Our ideas are our own philosophies. They're clueless. We, we worship ourselves and we're clueless. But here's the second one. Inanimate objects can't return life. They can only suck it up. The only value is worshiping something that can give and has given life. Eternal, extended, no end, no depth, no breath, beyond imagine. That's worth worshiping and it will bring life. Everything else in our life that we sue to, to pour ourselves into and it's dead, it can only produce death. It can never give back life. Why spend time, energy, money, worshiping things that cannot return squat? That's a, that's a very Greek, highly technical phrase there. <laughs> worshiping idols take more a toll on you than you think they do. Take more of a toll. They extract more of a payment than you think it extracts. All right, here's the last one for this section. God gives over, but he doesn't give up. God gives over, doesn't give up. Have you ever asked yourself why the earth is so bad? Why is there so much evil? Paul answers it here. This, this is the, the gave over that he mentions three times. He gave, over, he gave them over to their sinful desires. He gave them over to their shameful lusts. He gave them over to a depraved mind. Basically what God says is this. You want to continue chasing that stuff? Okay. I've given you every opportunity not to. I've given you every, every alter, alternative route. I, I've showed my way to you through creation. I've, I've done all this. But if you want to continue to keep down that road, you know what? I'm not going to stop you. Okay. And what we have, when Paul mentions homosexuality in this passage, now you recognize he doesn't stop there. I mean, every one of us should be ducking when we're reading all that. But it was something very specific with homosexuality. The height of God's creation was mankind. The development, the creation of man and woman, uniquely designed to be together to give life. And his point here is, in getting over to just what everybody wanted to do and how they want to do it, the ultimate, the ultimate um, I guess, converse act to the life God gave was this depraved abomination of creation that even, even men and women, even the height of creation, have given up how they were created for unnatural relations. Now later, he's going to speak specifically about Acts, but I want you to see that today, in this passage, he is really looking at this as the ultimate fall away from God's created design and order. Homosexuality has been around since Paul's writing and before. It's nothing new. There's nothing new about it. The approval of it, nothing new about it. But I guarantee you, if I got each of you in a room, one-on-one, -on -one, and you trusted me enough and we had a discussion about this, there would be a high percentage of people that would say, you know what, though, I just, I just don't know if I see anything wrong with it. They should be able to pursue their life the way they want to pursue their life. And I just, I just think that ultimately that's kind of how, you know, whatever makes them happy. Now, but I think when you begin articulating and we would talk together, I think you could, might come to a different conclusion. But the way our culture keeps pushing it is somehow we treat this as a civil right. That's what, that's what we're made to believe, that it's a civil right. Well, you know what? It can be a civil right. The last time I checked, God wasn't involved in establishing civil rights or, or, or governments. Or, or, you know, he establishes his kingdom. And he's not saying, well, damn you. He's saying, I've created all of this to point to me. Man, you guys, you've pointed everything in the other direction. You've missed it so badly. But so is gossips. We've missed it badly too. 
disobeying our parent. We've missed it badly too. God gave up, gave them up, but he doesn't give up. Now, chapter 2 is a great chapter too, it, it, but ultimately what chapter 2 is saying is that you can be a Jew on the outside, but it only matters if you're a Jew on the inside. So let me say it for our vernacular. You can be religious on the outside, but it's really irrelevant unless you're spiritual on the inside. Did the Jews get a head start? You say, you know, that's that's basic saying. So Jews, you think you got a head start. But you can be circumcised and still even approve of or do all whatever these things are and does you no good. This is not an outside in faith, it's an inside out faith. So we can sit and look at the list and look at the people. And we can look down our nose at them. And Paul basically in chapter 2 says, you're guilty of all this stuff too somehow. So you either deal with your own guiltiness because you looking at other people and thinking they're guilty and you're measuring yourself against them, that's a losing game. You need to pick another one. That's what chapter 2 says. At least that's how I read it. Here's the end of chapter 3. Because in the chapter 3 is how God doesn't give up. Okay? He gave up, but he doesn't give up. Romans 3, 30, 21 through 23. But now... Apart from the law of righteousness. And so this is the hard thing about Romans. It's not a soundbite book, guys. I can't pick out one little cute phrase and spend time. I mean, it's, everything gets linked together and layered. Because even when he says, but now, it's talking about all that we talked about at the end of chapter 1, all of chapter 2, most of chapter 3, and he gets to the end of chapter 3, and that's what his but now is. Okay, But now, apart from the law of righteousness of God, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Read, all have fallen short from the perfection that is God. That would be another way that you could look at it, maybe wrap your brain around it, okay? All right, righteousness. Main theme of the book of Romans. Paul taught, it's a legal term talking about being in right standing with. Being in right standing with God. It, it can only be conveyed through faith in Jesus. We have to believe in the one that satisfies the wrath of God on the cross. No one is exempt before standing before God. And nobody, nobody measures up on their own. Someone name me the most moral person that you know. Or even history. You might not have to get personal and say it's your husband or wife or anything. But most, most moral person, if we were picking out moral people like the hierarchy of top ten moral people, throw out some people to me. Thank you very much, Jaime. Thank you. Thank you. What's that? All right, let's just choose Billy Graham. Me and Billy are pretty close, but let's, let's just choose Billy. I, I'm probably only a few billion people short of, of, of hearing me speak. All right. Billy Graham. How many of you feel like you measure up to Billy Graham? Raise your hand. Okay, so when this verse says... All have fallen short, all of sin and fallen short of glory of God. Do you understand that it included Billy Graham? First service chose Mother Teresa. We can't even get to Mother Teresa or Billy Graham. How are we ever going to get to God? It, 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 you know, it's, it's like the old joke about the two guys camping and a bear shows up. And they're sitting by the campfire, and they have their shoes off. And one guy slowly bends down to start to put his shoes on. The other guy looks at him very still and says, dude, are you crazy? You can't outrun, outrun a bear. The guy continues to put his shoes on and says, dude, I don't have to outrun that bear. I just got to outrun you. <laughs> the lingering is the people who have never heard it before. <laughs> We've all fallen short. So what's the answer? He says what the answer is. Verse 24. And all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. Justification, another legal term. Freely through the grace of redemption. Redemption means to buy back. To buy back. Okay? So, the first part of Romans said that he identified himself as a slave to Christ. 
The redemption, the word redemption, the buy back means to be bought back out of slavery. So Paul's saying that through Christ, we were bought back out of slavery. So that means who do we belong to? Belong to Christ. Now, I want you to understand something. We said last week that ownership, you had to settle the ownership issue to continue to walk out of Christian faith. And here he emphasizes it again. Because, look, it might not sound you, it, it, great against our Western sensitivities to t- call ourselves a slave to anybody, but there are plenty of people that do not understand the lordship of Christ. We want the salvation of Christ, but salvation of Christ and the lordship of Christ cannot be separated. It can't be separated. Because redemption is we're bought out of this slavery and we're bought into his family. You've got to settle the ownership, lordship issue or you will not, this faith isn't going to work for you. You're going to say, well, I tried that and that doesn't work. This is not a that. This is a relationship with God through Christ. That's what this is. It's not a that. It's a who. You have got to settle the lordship issue. We are redeemed and brought out, but how we get redeemed is amazing to me. The phrase, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Here, So one of the great ways I like looking at the word atonement is in three syllables. At one meant. At one meant. Atonement. We're brought in right relationship. And how are we brought? Look and listen to the language. God presented Christ. See, the cross that was intended to be a shameful way to execute an end of movement was God's way to stand up in front of the whole world of all time to present Christ as our sacrifice. His presentation. And it, I think, even though I, I, I can't fathom how painful it was for Christ to physically hang on the cross and to be beaten to that place. I think as Christians, a lot of times we get too wrapped, we get too wrapped up in all that. There's been so many studies done, but when the nails, where it went, how long and what he died, you know, and okay, I can get, I can get all that. But what about when the whole earth goes dark? What's going on there? I'll tell you what's going on there. Christ receives the wrath of God because he takes on the sin of mankind your sin's pitiful compared to the sin of mankind. We have all contributed to the sin of mankind. And he bears the separation, that weight, all on himself. And so that his father, who he left heaven and left that glory, that glory behind to be on earth, fully man and fully God, endures the wrath of the sin that he carried from his father. No amount of physical pain could ever measure measure up to that wrath that he felt from God. The wrath that should have gone by our actions, he stands before. Come on up, Michael and the team. Now, I've come down last week, and so I'm going to make a habit of it. We're going to receive communion. And um, in in the Old Testament, there was something called the Ark of the Covenant. And I know this is a refresher for a lot of you, but for some of you it may be new, okay? So the Ark of the Covenant was the representation of God. In the Ark, in the Ark contained the table, the the, the Ten Commandments. Am I messing things up by standing in front of this because I'm hearing an echo? Um, The Ten Commandments, God's handwritten notes on how to follow the faith, contained a plate of bread that would have been given uh, during their... uh, travels in the wilderness to show the provision of God. And then there was Aaron's rod. You know, would have carried a rod or a staff. And in and and one particular instance to demonstrate who God was, it, it budded with almonds. And, and these, are, these are in there. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And then they built a tabernacle. First, it was a tabernacle that was a tent. Then it got transferred, and it was, and it was, a, it was a large structure. And in that, in, in that three courts you get to, there was a place called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, let's call this the Ark of the Covenant today, the Ark of the Covenant was there. And it was encapsulated in, in tall linens, really high, and only one time of year could anybody enter, and only one person could. It was the high priest. And the high priest would enter in Yom, Yom Kippur. And, but they would actually literally tie a rope around his ankle. 
and he would have he would have he would have some kind of uh, metal or bells that would have been when sewn in the bottom of his garment. Why? Because listen, if you entered into the presence of God, if you entered the righteousness of God, and you yourself were not righteous, you would die. And it was his task once a year to enter in there and to take the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it on. They had like angels' wings carved up here. And, and in between there, that was called, it had the phrase, mercy seat. And they would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. It was, it was, it was God's way to try to help them understand that he was real and he was tangible. And then he would come and he would rest on the mercy seat to receive an offer of sacrifice for the forgiveness of Israel for the next year. But when Paul uses the language that I read to you in this chapter, he doesn't identify the Ark of the Covenant as the mercy seat. He identifies Jesus as the mercy seat. So we don't come to a place, we come to a who. And it is his salvation work on the cross where we have life. He's the one that offers mercy and grace. He's the one that satisfies the wrath of God. He is the mercy seat. It was well defined. Don't go near there. You will die. You could even see that the, maybe the curtains would have been maybe a representation of the righteousness of God that said, beware of this place. And yet when Christ dies on the cross and the veil is torn, now the righteousness of God that kept people at arm's length now hems them in. And by faith we become the righteousness of God. Not because of what we have, but because of who He is. And that He is a God full of love and mercy and grace that wants to restore mankind to Himself. So He redeems. He sends His creation he loves us enough to let us chase all the junk we want to chase. Because what he is hoping for is before it kills you, you'll discover that it is a dead end. And you'll come back to him. He gave us over to, but he doesn't give up on us. We're going to receive communion today as a response to this message. That it is the mercy seat it is his representation that he leaves with us from as far back as the Old Testament as a representation of deliverance. But when Jesus introduces it at the last Passover, he frames it a whole different way for them, that he was going to be the deliverer. And it wasn't going to be political. It was going to be spiritual. And that he was coming again. His resurrection would be the sign that he would return again. And when we receive this, we receive it, one, by, by, by it's the mercy of God. And we remember the mercy of God on the cross each time we receive communion. And we actually even proclaim his death until he comes back again. So you might not be a follower of Christ today. You, you might have never made the decision that he is the righteousness of God and you want that. Well, before you receive communion today, you have that opportunity. You have the opportunity to confess your sin and make him Lord. And you have the opportunity to be grafted into a family that you really weren't a part of before. Now, taking communion, hold still for a minute, guys. Taking communion is not a salvation act. It's a reflection of what's taken place in your life. So, if, I know every week we have people that are still trying to explore this faith out, and I, I, I love it. Matter of fact, I love, you know, when you had them sing, I surrender all, and I heard all the voices. But you know what else I like? I like hearing some silence sometimes, too, because that would mean that there's still people struggling with this idea, do I really surrender all to God? And you are in the right place. Can I, can I tell you, this isn't a place of outsiders and insiders. This is the right place to be to wrestle with this stuff. And if you haven't wrestled this down yet, I just encourage you, just, just let the communion just let it pass by. We, every single time we do communion, there are people that let it pass by. And I'm so excited the fact that you would explore whether or not Christ is real or not in this room together with us. This is a safe place for you to do that. Now, Father, we
We represent mankind, your creation in this room. Lord, with many of us who have have received by faith what you've given, but Lord, I know there's others that still struggle and wrestle, whether this is real or not or made up or not. Lord, I know there's still some that, that wrestle. How do I even live this faith out? And, and, and But if we live it by faith, complete belief and trust that you presented your son at the cross as our mercy seat. By your blood, Lord, we are redeemed. We're brought back, and you are now our Lord. And Lord, as we take of this today, we do so in an acknowledgement that once again, we receive your sacrifice for us, and we recommit ourselves to your lordship. In the name of Jesus, we pray.